Good afternoon and welcome to the third session of this today's afternoon. We started with the sun for sunshine. I don't know how it is in other regions, but here it is getting darker, but we still stay here fresh. I just uh, wanted only to ask my speaker to get themselves a, a glass of water, just um, what I would do being present uh, with them in one room, but it's, uh, it might be uh, practical. Uh, we will have three uh, papers in this session, three very interesting papers, um, and uh, we will follow the same schedule as with previous sessions. We will have uh, first uh, the papers, and then um, uh, we will have some time for the discussion at the end. I will um, present each speaker before the paper, and we will start with and Buckley, our dear colleague from uh, Dublin, from Ireland. Uh, hello, uh, Anne, uh, once again. And Buckley is, um, 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 her main to uh, subject is musicology, but she's working also very interdisciplinary, as I know. Uh, she is today the associate, um, research associate at the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at the Trinity College in Dublin, but studied at University uh, College in Cork, and she did her doctoral studies in Amsterdam at the University of Cambridge, uh, had held positions in Ireland, United Kingdom, France, Belgium, and Romania. Uh, she was researcher scholar at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge, and after that, research fellow at, and research associate at Darwin College in uh, Cambridge. So um, today, um, um, uh, and we'll talk about Marian, her, her paper is named Marian Devotion in Poetry and Song in Medieval Ireland and Scotland, a newly identified musical source. So welcome, Anne, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah, for that warm introduction. I'm delighted to be part of this conference. Should I start by sharing my screen now? Yes, please. How is that? Is that all right? It's perfectly fine. Thank you. Excellent. I should just add that um, I have made a slight change in the title and the reason for that will become apparent as I go through the paper. So apologies for that, but I thought it was better just to leave things stand. <clears throat> until I could explain things for it to you. So I'm going to talk about devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary in medieval Ireland and Scotland. The earliest Western depiction of the Virgin and Child appears in the 8th, 9th century Irish and Scottish High Crosses and in the Book of Kells, which is dated to circa 800. All of them associated with the familia, the Columban familia, that is the community of St. Columba, an Irish man, an Irish monk from County Donegal, Northwest Ireland, who founded the Abbey of Iona in the mid sixth century, and from where a large network of monasteries spread throughout Western Scotland and Ireland, and as far as Lindisfarne in Northumbria in Northeast England. Iona seems to have been at the forefront of devotion to the Virgin Mary from the 8th century on, as witness images in sculpture and in manuscripts. And here we have an image from the Book of Kells itself dating to circa 1800, 800, I beg your pardon. And as far as is known, it is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, medieval Western manuscript depictions of the Virgin and Child. It comes at a time, or just slightly postdates the time, when Mary's four great feasts were established by Pope Sergius, who was Pope Sergius I, who was Pope from 687 to 701. These four great feasts were the Annunciation on the 25th of March, the Dormition on the 15th of August, the Nativity on the 8th of September, and the Presentation in the Temple on the 2nd of February. That the Book of Kells image may have been modelled on an icon at Iona. This is open to speculation, but what is interesting here is that Bede 
also refers to an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, among others, as having been brought from Rome to Monk Wermouth Jarrow. And it could just be that the same would have applied in Iona, that the image was brought from Ionan monks visiting Rome. Now to move on to the high crosses, we have several high crosses from Ireland and Scotland depicting the Virgin Mary. Here you see the Virgin holding the child at the head of the cross here. And I have a, sorry, yes, that's right. That's, excuse me, that is um, a close up of it. And what interests me there, apart from the fact that it's unusual to see imagery like this so early on, is that many of these high crosses tend to have figures of the crucifixion or the, um, or, or the last judgment of Christ in glory. And these stand out as being quite unusual, that it, not only is the Virgin Mary there, but that she's depicted in a very prominent position. Other Scottish crosses include St. Oren's and the Kildalton Cross on the Isle of Isla. And moving to an Irish example, we have here Drumcliffe, cross from County Sligo, which is a little bit later, dating to the 11th century. And its significance here is not only, I should point out that it's at the end of the arm, it's rather weathered, unfortunately, now. It's to be found just here on the extremity of the arm. Uh, but it, it's, it's a slightly later, and it's also um, a part of the Columban, the later Columban network. So again, we see that link with the Ionan um, influence, with the Ionan uh, notion. Now, devotion to Mary on Iona has been linked also to the promotion of the idea of the protection of non-combatants, as set out in the Lex Innocentium by Adovnon, ninth abbot of Iona and author of an important biography of St. Columba, as well as of a guide to the Holy Land, which includes an extremely detailed map of the city of Jerusalem. The Lex Innocentium advocated that women, children and clergy be protected from assault while traveling. And this in fact would be the first human rights document in, hum in European history. The relevance of this for our topic is seen in later editions of the text, known also as Coin Adavnon, which suggests that it was the Blessed Virgin who urged Adavnon to promote the law, and that he did it, quote, for the sake of Mary, mother of Jesus Christ, end of quote. The literary and poetic output on Iona was considerable, and this includes the Marian hymn, Cantemus in Omni Die, by Ku Quivna, his nickname meaning Hound of Memory, one of the contributors to the Collectio Canonum Hibernensis, who was also protector of Columbus relics at the time of his death in 747 at the hands of Viking invaders. Excuse me. <clears throat> Marian themes are witnessed also among other medieval Hiberno, Latin and Irish vernacular hymns stretching from the 9th to the 12th centuries. And St. Bridget of Kildare, Ireland's most prominent female saint, was known as Mary of the Gael. Moving on chronologically, there is also striking evidence of the importance of Mary in the religious devotion of the French and English of post 12th century medieval Ireland, post Norman in other words. Examples include the presence of a discrete sense set of 40 Marian sequences in the so-called Dublin Trooper, which is now in Cambridge University Library, additional manuscript 710, dated to circa 1300. There are few known concordances of these sequences, but it is fair to say that no systematic study of these has been undertaken since Hesbera's facsimile edition, which was published long ago now in 1966. Unfortunately, it is long out of print and in great need of revision. Thus far, the manuscript has not been digitized. However, it is included in the Cantus Index, which at least means we have a complete list of contents. And highly relevant for today is that Hannah Vilhova Werner herself ha was in touch with me not too long ago about this manuscript because she has noted that a du the Dublin version of the sequence Flos de Spina is found in several late medieval sources from Bohemia.
this was something I added in, but wasn't planning to say anything about just to show you the um, extent of slightly later statues. We have found three in the northwest of Ireland, and this is a particularly fine one, a wooden polychrome statue associated perhaps with the Dominicans, but that's open to discussion. And my final um, present, my final section for the presentation is a puzzle to some extent, and it's a question which I would like to leave with you. And indeed the reason why I had to change the subtitle of my paper. Um, this hymn has been identified in a miscellaneous collection from an Anglo-Norman milieu in Ireland, dating to the 13th or early 14th century. It's been worked on at the moment, the manuscript as a whole is being worked at, on at the moment by a Dominican colleague of mine called Connor McDonough, who is preparing to write a piece, an article on the entire book. The collection includes a copy of the papal bull Laudabiliter, prom promulgated in 1155 by Pope Adrian IV, the only English Pope, who authorised Henry II to invade and govern Ireland. It also includes a copy of Gerald of Wales's Topographia Hibernia, along with a number of devotional texts, including the Creed and Pater Noster in Hiberno English and a metrical Lord's Prayer. Along with this song, Ave Gemma Prefulgida. According to the British Library online catalogue, this is a hymn to the Virgin Mary with musical notation, which is what led me to include it initially in my paper. The opening strophe is supplied with the hymn melody, Ame Gemma Prefulgida. As you can see here, the full first strophe has notation, but the rest of the hymn is, as commonly is the case, is not provided with the music. Now it looks like the people who catalogued this would probably, possibly didn't look beyond the first folio, or it could also be that a little message that's to be contained within it wasn't spotted until again quite recently. Um, this is the text of the of the first two strophes. I'm going to have to move this a tiny bit. There we are, sorry. Um, Ave Gemma Prefulgida Supra Crystalum Splendida Candens Margarita Candens Que Margarita. Now the interesting thing here is that it has now been identified as a hymn from Margaret of Antioch. And the, there are a number of, of clues about this. First of all, the reference to Margarita, first time Margarita, the, it could have been spelled either way. That, that is not in itself the, the clue, as it were. But it was it's particularly a reference to feeding his sheep, Holibrius found you, O prudent Margarita. And Holibrius was, in fact, a predator, somebody who um, was very interested in having a relationship with Margarita and obviously it's a, it's a text that refers to St. Margaret of Antioch and not to the Virgin Mary. However, I've, I have, um, I've decided to include it for a number of reasons. Uh, seems got so stuck here, we? There we are. Yeah, there's the, um, there's my transcription of the first strophe. So it is a play on the word pearl, Margarita Margareta, who was also known as Marina, incidentally. So while this now eliminates the hymn as one expressing Marian devotion, I've nonetheless decided to include it here, not because I was already committed to it, but rather because I have not so far found any concordance for the melody. And I would like to suggest the possibility that it may be a contrafactum of a Marian hymn or of another hymn already in circulation. Nevertheless, the possibility remains open that it was composed especially for St. Margaret. So this presentation really was a series of vignettes to give you some overview of the sort of material that we have in an Irish and earlier Scottish context. And I'd be very interested in any comments or observations that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, very much for your paper, for your beautiful pictures and also piece of music. And um, we might be interested to in singing then, maybe in the break or after that. Um, it, this is quite an unusual piece of music because it starts with a recitative, da, 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 so four C's. 
the mm. petition uh, hymns or Gregorian melodies didn't like very much repetition uh, unless it was a recitative performance of, of psalm yeah. or whatever. Mm. So um, this is, um, I wonder if uh, somebody else has also observations. And I, I would have also questions maybe about the notation, but we can leave it for later. Now uh, I would like to ask for uh, questions, the audience, and again, you can raise your hand or you can uh, write your question in the chat. So as long as there are no questions, maybe, uh, and can we maybe stay with the last picture that you have shown with okay. him. Um, yes. First of all, can you tell us <laughs> something about the picture which, which is uh, below uh, the hymn melody? <laughs> I wish I could. As I say, the, the work on this manuscript is at quite an early stage, so I cannot tell you anything about the picture. But I would say that um, it is highly, it is in very good condition, and there are a lot of there, there is there is a lot of decoration in the manuscript. I would have to refer you to Connor McDonough, who's actually working on it at the moment. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, um, we have here in the chat a um, um, message from Sue Nebzidovsky. She says, very interesting paper, thank you. And does the hymn mention the dragon? No. No dragons. I but I, I, I don't have a full a copy of it here on my PowerPoint, but I'd be very happy to share it afterwards with anybody who's interested. Thank you. Yes, so the reason I asked is that there are two um, contesting versions of the life of St. Margaret, and I wondered what you had in this ah. really early example. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'd be very happy to share the text with you. Uh, Mary Wolinski asks, is there some measured notation in the beginning? Yes, very interesting question. What do you think, Anne? Mm, that's often difficult to know, isn't it? Mm. So maybe we can ask, Mary, did you have a suggestion how we should doesn't look, read it? It doesn't look like that to me, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, but I'd be interested in anybody else's thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, I, thank you very much for your paper. It's just that it looks like it, the C's, uh, you have like two notes that look like longs, and then the other ones, um, I mean, you know, Franconian, they would be like mm. uh, uh, semi-briefs, but yeah. I think like sometimes that sort of ROM shape could also stand for briefs in uh, insular manuscripts in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, you know, there are some even chant manuscripts that I've seen that use what look like measured note values, mensural notation, a little bit spottily here and there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if Gemma is meant to be sung faster than Ave. Mm -hmm. That's just a thought. Mm -hmm. The other thing is sometimes in these manuscripts, you find that stems have been added subsequently. I don't know if that's particularly the case here, but it's not always obvious from an image. So it might be worth, I haven't managed to see the original, you see. It might be worth a thought. Thank you. Thank you too. Uh, if I may, very short, sure, we have another question, but I wanted to follow up. This was my question uh, really concerning the notation while why the scribe writes the C's with two different shapes, with the, what looks like longa in the major notation and semibrevis like in mental notation. He doesn't use the semibrevis any, um, any for a single pitch mm -hmm. in, in, in an, uh, uh, at another place. He uses it in, um, in, um, uh, in uh, small uh, short melismas, as we know from Escurentes yeah. this year, yeah. but not uh, but not in the recit uh, not in, as a single pitch, which is quite interesting. Mm. But uh, and is it a, is it a contemporary hand or is it a, an addition? Is it the only one notated piece in in this? It's the only notated piece, and as far oh. as I I understand, and that's the view of any of the other people looking at it, that it is contemporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question uh, uh, in chat from Mariana Lima. Could you please give more details about Dublin Trooper that is in Cambridge? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do I start? <laughs> uh, 
Well, it is a troper constitutionary. In other words, it has a lot of serum uh, constitutional material and it has a large body of uh, notated chant for the year, essentially. Um, it has some sequences for St. Patrick. It also has some unique material for Ed Edmund of Canterbury, along with what is the striking collection of 40 Marian sequences. So it is a very rich musical document and very under-researched. It also has a couple of Latin lays, the Song of the Flood, and it contains the Angelus ad Virginum in one and in three voices. So it was quite miscellaneous in some ways too. The, the, the list of, I, I can send you the link for the Cantus Index if you wish. Sorry, thank in you. The uh, uh, I should oh. say it, was, it would belong to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And I would love if you can send me the, the link. link. With yeah. pleasure. Thank Certainly. you. Maybe other questions? And it's 40, uh, 13th century, you said, Anne? The that is the current century? view. Circa 1300, sorry. Circa 1300. 1300. Sorry, are so... you speaking about the Dublin Trooper? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had this other one in front of me. Yes, circa 1300 is the current prevailing view. Mm -hmm. Yes. But as I say, it, it, it's really not been um, researched to that great extent. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more work needs to be done on it. And excuse me, my ignorance, you mentioned the sarum um, a little, uh, right. Is, does it mean that Dublin had a sarum use? Yes. Ah, okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. Why is that actually? Well, it, it's a consequence of um, the Norman hegemony in Ireland with the, with the coming of the Normans and the reforms of the Irish church. Um, the Sarum manuscripts were gradually introduced and became standard by the 14th, 15th century. So this would be one of the earlier ones. And there was a very close link between the hierarchy of Dublin and Salisbury. In fact, St. Patrick's Cathedral architecture was modelled on the Cathedral of Salisbury. So it was a very close association. Okay, thank you. So could it be that would be uh, the repertory of tropes, sequences, whatever that we know from the Dublin troper Mm -hmm. uh, would be actually used in Salisbury as well? Well, again, it, yes, in principle, yes, but as, as I'm sure you'd, you'd be aware, there are, diff there are certain regional differences sometimes. Not everybody used the same. They might have, they have the standard reference, of course, but sometimes there are local variations. Mm -hmm. But the, the main body of the repertoire would be Sarum. Yeah. And that's yeah. why these sequences stand out, actually, because it's unusual to find such an extensive body of material that doesn't seem to have other concordances. And this link you brought up, brought to my attention with Bohemia is quite fascinating because we can only speculate as to how it circulated or where, or whether it came from Dublin or came from elsewhere, but this just happens to be the oldest witness. It's very interesting. Well, I mean, I found this sequence in the West, <laughs> on the continent. Yeah, I, I, we, uh, it's, we have also other uh, inscriptions of this sequence. So the, yes. um, the, it's not only the exclusive uh, concordances. So, uh, yes. Okay, so do we have more questions again in, in chat to, to be um, and presented a very large selection of materials, visual, musical, If not, so and thank you very much My pleasure. for your contribution once again. And um, I would ask Riane, Riane, do you think that we can start with the next paper or shall we wait five minutes uh, so to run according to the program? What would you like me to, how shall we proceed now? Shall we leave five minutes? Because there might be people coming just for um, second paper. We can absolutely wait five minutes. We didn't give specific times for individual papers. We didn't. We no, didn't. Okay. No. So I think we can we can follow. We can we can continue, and maybe we, we will have a discussion at the end. And we had discussion right now, uh, which be slightly um, uh, break, broke the schedule. So sorry for that. 
So now um, the next paper is by Hai Kutijian, who has many interests and uh, many professions. Uh, Hai Kutijian is currently based in Prague. I think I can safely say it as much. Uh, he is an orchestra conductor, chorus master, and musicologist, and uh, he's, uh, he's native in Cyprus. He um, has wide research interests in the musicology and theology of uh, the Armenian hymnal and in the works of St. Gregory of Narek. He's, he published uh, several volumes, including, they, uh, this is the title, They Who Imbibed the Effusions of the Spirit, the Art of the Armenian Book Through the Ages. Uh, or Treasures of the Earliest Christian Nation, Spirituality, Art and Music in Medieval Armenian Manuscripts. And I should also mention that he is editor of the um, recently edited um, Botag Mess in D, um, which is a 19th century vocal orchestra work. So, Haik, thank you very much coming uh, with your title, with your uh, uh, paper, which is devoted to the topic, Manifestations of Marian Devotion in Armenian Sacred Music and Theology in the Late Middle Ages, taken us out of Europe, and this is now your floor. Thank you very much, Hannah, for that very kind introduction. I shall endeavor to maximize my slides okay perhaps that's better uh, please protest if you are not able to see the entirety of my slide in the absence of protests i shall proceed now given that we're talking because i, I shall try to focus uh, on the late Middle Ages as uh, required, I shall try to place uh, things within the uh, context of uh, quite a magnificent and rich legacy of 1,300 years, uh, displaying impressive stylistic uh, plurality. Um, and the oldest examples uh, come from visual culture. So I shall start by showing you some nice uh, pictures. Besides, as we shall see, odes and hymns uh, devoted to the uh, Virgin Mary are also usually highly evocative uh, visually. Um, now, these images uh, surely will evoke in your mind uh, interactions with Byzantine, Western, and perhaps with other Eastern traditions. And uh, that, that is really rather obvious. Uh, and although the argument has not been clinched, and it's not the subject of my talk this evening, it is, in my view, reasonable to postulate similar interactions with sister traditions also in the realms of poetry, theology, and music. But let us proceed without further ado to a, a quick look. Now, uh, we start with uh, some uh, representations of the Annunciation. In the second image, there's even some bad Greek, Heredismos written with an epsilon instead of an alpha, yoda, diphthong. Um, on the extreme right-hand side, in the lower corner, there's a very, very unusual image of the visitation uh, that's not common in the Armenian tradition. Uh, let's continue now uh, along the time axis, as it were. I've mentioned the years, wherever known, and the locations. Um, again, this is representations of the uh, Annunciation. Uh, some more, and we are now approaching the early modern period, of course. And uh, there are a lot of contrasts and uh, commonalities. Um, now, the image on the left, which was recently drawn to my attention by my colleague, Professor Christina Maranji, very kindly, is in Berlin. And at first sight, it looks very, very different from the one on the right hand side, but in fact, 
A moment's inspection shows that compositionally they have more in common, although, of course, uh, evidently there was more gold available by the people who were illustrating the second manuscript chronologically earlier, of course, uh, than the first. So all these are a very fertile area of study, and I'm just uh, showing them to you as a sort of agreeable visual uh, precursor to the main body of my talk, which would be musical. Uh, let's look at the Dormition as well, which in a moment we shall see is very important from the point of view of the Armenian hymnal as well. Um, and far less common, indeed, to this day I've come across only a single image, and I'll show it uh, a little later, is that of the third day of the Dormition, corresponding to a certain apocryphal tradition, uh, which I shall be glad to mention uh, in a few uh, moments. Um, before we proceed to music, let's uh, also remind ourselves that there are other uh, media as well. Uh, we don't have many examples of frescoes, but this one is a particularly spectacular one in the Cathedral of, uh, of uh, Ani uh, in the Honens Church. Uh, the left-hand side image in black and white shows you where it is placed on the wall and we have a close-up of the Dormition in color on the uh, right-hand side. And this is in Kansasar, in Artsakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and you can see that there's reliefs. Uh, in the center, above, in this triangular area, it's mother and child, but uh, as, again, Christina Maranji has pointed out, this does rather look that it might be a representation of the Dormition. Now, in order to see where much of this has come from, a very important text is an Armenian homily by Peter of Sunik. It, it dates from the 6th century. We know uh, a little bit about the life of the author. We know that he was a signatory of the Second Council of uh, Tavin between 555 and 556. He served as bishop in his area from 548, and he seems to have heeded what Proclus, the Constantinopolitan 5th century patriarch, had said, who had himself composed homilies, which were surely known in Armenia. Uh, had the word not dwelt in a womb, the flesh would never have sat on the throne. But in fact, he heeds much earlier advice, advice from none other than St. Luke, uh, uh, who in his Gospel in the 24th chapter says that we ought to interpret in all the scriptures the things concerning Mary. And uh, Petros seems to have taken this uh, to heart, and he refers to a lot of metaphors and poetic imagery, most of which is drawn from the old Testament. Now, though many of those images can be found in other earlier writers, particularly Syriac writers, they tend to be widely dispersed over numerous works and not concentrated in a single homily. Uh, so maybe uh, Petros was ahead of his time. Marian treatises became, of course, common in late 8th century Byzantine texts, people such as Andrew of Crete, uh, Yermanos of Constantinople, John Damaskin, and so forth. And the images uh, that he mentions are numerous. Uh, I've just selected a handful. Uh, Mary, uh, the God-bearer, the mother of God, is paradise planted by God. She is a pleasant vineyard. She is the burning bush that was not consumed. She is the rock that poured forth water. She is a golden urn or pitcher. She is a vessel of fragrant incense, and so on. Now, I made a list of all these and then looked at my canonical Armenian hymnal, and I located one by one occurrences of these and found that the vast majority of Petros's expressions uh, found in his homily are reflected in the hymnal. I even counted them. Some could be found uh, as many as 30 times. Others appeared only once. 
But of course, the hymnal also features some expressions not found on his list, because some hymnographers chose to be more original. Uh, I will present to you now four different items. Three of them are hymns, Unfading Flower, St. Mary O Golden Pitcher, and Sunrise Superior to the Sun, and an ode, which is a paraliturgical item that is not part of the hymnal, called Wondrous uh, Song. So let us start with the first of these. Unfading Flower, um, I'll just try to translate a little bit. O oh, unfading flower, uncondemned scion. She's uncondemned as opposed to Eve, who was condemned. Sprung upwards from the root of Jesse. Isaiah proclaimed thee in advance as being the receptacle of the spirit of the seven graces. Uh, this is Septem Partibus Lucens from uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 11. God-bearer and virgin, we magnify thee. Now, this hymn is uh, very, very interesting liturgically because it is used both in the Divine Liturgy as a prandy hymn, as a midday hymn, as a hymn that is associated with lunchtime, uh, on the first day of three of the Assumption, but it also serves as a prandy for the Divine Liturgy on the fifth day of the Nativity, and it serves as a hymn for Vespers on day nine following the Nativity. It belongs to the category of hymns which in the Armenian tradition are known as Magnificats, because they are preceded by the incipit Magnificat anima, anima mea dominum uh, uh, quotation from Luke, and they are all devoted to the Virgin uh, Mary. The Numations, this is one of the best sources on the extreme right-hand side. It's a pre-1305 codex uh, that was commissioned by the Cilician Armenian king Hetum II. And you can see that this is very unusual. Well, perhaps you cannot tell it is unusual, but you must believe me uh, when I say that it's unusual, having inspected a good many of those, uh, in that it has this preponderance of these long diagonal lines uh, perhaps displaying different angles of inclination. And of course, we're not able to read the Armenian medieval neumes. And so in printed versions, this version on the left has chosen to interpret most of them as being the same thing. Whereas the Venetian Archbishop Gurerian, who was almost obsessive about things like this, as you can see at the bottom, this is from the preface of his 1898 edition, he has distinguished various different uh, versions. Maybe he has even mistaken noise for signal because the uh, clerk who was copying this out may have been a little tired and a slightly different angle of inclination need not necessarily be meaningful. But you can see in his publication that uh, one might say with exaggeration, no two of these are identical, they're all slightly different. This was because he wanted to make his publication useful for research purposes by people who did not have access to uh, manuscripts uh, necessarily. The version that is sung to this day, of course, I would not claim for one moment that it has very much to do with the medieval melody that may have been sung, is um, not entirely syllabic, but it is quite simple. I'll sing a little. But we find a Constantinopolitan version transcribed by Dundesian in the uh, late 19th century which may have been more suitable for use at Vespers, where there is more time. And so on. It's a little more melismatic, but it is merely an elaboration of the first melody, or maybe the first melody is a simplification of this second. Uh, but what is a fascinating discovery is that the very same words could be pressed into service 
to be sung during the preparation of the gifts in the course of a divine liturgy. And therefore here we have only a single stanza. It starts from the bottom of the left-hand side page. Uh, but it is so very melismatic that even a couple of words take quite a few lines. And, oh, oh, And that's just the third word, first word, antaram, unfading. Now, let's continue to another very interesting hymnographer, a woman. She was Sahak Tucht. She was very celebrated. She was the sister of Bishop Stephen of Sunik, who is known uh, not least as a translator into Armenian of the Corpus Areopagiticum in a somewhat Hellenistic, Hellenizing uh, style. And it seems that this... Uh, Hymnographer, she was famed for her beauty, and therefore, in teaching young monks, she had to do so behind a curtain, so as not to inspire her pupils in an inappropriate manner. And only one stanza of her hymn has reached us, and it has become somehow uh, uh, appended to the end of a hymn devoted to Saint uh, Nicholas. Um, there would have been other stanzas almost certainly. Nowadays this hymn is sung from the middle of Lent at Compline on Wednesday evenings and the text is O Saint Mary, golden pitcher, ark of the testaments who grantedst the bread of life from on high to our famished nature, ever intercede with him for the expiation of our sins. My third example is an ode by the 10th century mystic uh, St. Gregory of Narek, who five years ago, six years ago, was declared uh, a doctor of the Universal Church. And this is now completely original, different from the rather formulaic uh, uh, metaphors prescribed by Peter of Sunik centuries earlier. And the ode starts by comparing the Virgin Mary uh, with a song. She herself is music. She is a wondrous song. But there is a second part to the ode, which in later manuscripts appears as a separate piece, as an antiphon to the first, uh, in which she is described in a very direct and perhaps daring way for her beauty. Her eyes, sea beside sea, overflowing with abundant smiles in the morning as two flashing suns. Um, this is one of the most reliable manuscripts uh, known uh, to me, and I hope you can see my second arrow. That's where her eyes, sea beside sea, which can be sung as an independent ode, and that's the beginning of it. As you can see, certain syllables are densely uh, numated. Um, tradition has it, as you can see in these rather later, in this later manuscript on the right hand side, or the prayer scroll on the left hand side, St. Gregory is believed to have had a vision on the shore of Lake Van, uh, beholding the Virgin Mary with, with the infant Jesus uh, 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 on her lap. Uh, on the island of Arder, which still exists. Um, and so her, his description of her beauty and of her appearance and of her attire and of her manner of walking and so on and so forth, uh, of course, they need not surprise us because, of course, beauty and wisdom uh, have biblical precedence. Desirable women may be found in the sapiential books of the Bible, not to mention the Song of Songs, of course. And the Virgin Mary personifies the church. She represents the church in both senses, um, both as the uh, building and as the community of the faithful. And she is a picture for the reed sapling. The reed sapling is Christ. 
Uh, but this also has some other overtones because in, Ar in Armenian tradition, in the Armenian tradition, the pagan god Vahakun has been described as being born as a smoking and flaming reed. So this immediately harks back to the birth of a pagan god, uh, a very uh, jarring analogy, but one which surely would not have been lost uh, on contemporary uh, readers or listeners. And the ode also refers to an elm and a vine in a passage that was not well understood and in later manuscripts scribes actually crossed it out and altered it. Uh, I was privileged to resolve this matter, I hope, once and for all a couple of years ago. Uh, in fact, traditionally, elms, which are trees that themselves do not yield fruit, have been used as physical supports and frames for vines to grow. And of course, uh, according to the Gospel uh, of St. John, vines represent Christ. So that's yet another analogy. But the ode also has ideas of rays of light beaming down from the high window, which makes us think of sundials, but also of the feast of the dripping of a ray of light, according to a vision by St. Gregory's namesake, St. Gregory the Illuminator, early in the uh, fourth century, he had a vision of Christ himself descending, as you can see in this hymnal uh, illustration in the middle of the right-hand side column of my slide, Christ himself descending and showing where he wanted his church to be constructed, uh, indicating it with a golden hammer. So, so much about this ode. Now, I do hope that time will permit uh, my allowing you to read uh, Professor Terian's English translation of at least the second part of this ode, because the words are really rather exquisite as well as perhaps surprising, as I uh, will give you a couple of minutes in which to read the words, I will play you an historic recording of this ode. Of course, I don't pretend for one moment that it's a medieval melody. It's probably much later from the early modern period. Highly melismatic, and we shall only get around to hearing uh, the melody corresponding to the very first line, if that. So I shall allow you now quietly to read the words. I'm afraid we have to pass on to uh, my next example, uh, which is a later hymn, Sunrise Superior to the Sun. Uh, it's an acrostic. It has initially 36 stanzas, one starting with each of the letters of the Armenian alphabet, um, and then with an additional section of which uh, the beginning of each line uh, allows us to form the name 
Archimandrite Giragos. And there is some ambiguity as to which Giragos precisely is being referred to. So there are two or even three alternative sets of dates for the author. Um, I will try to avoid going into those details. Uh, but the fact that it's a strophic thing and which has more or less regular meter, uh, it's interesting for pneumatological studies uh, because you can see that from time to time there may be an excess syllable or indeed there may be a defective line with one syllable missing and the neumes are designed to compensate for these things and ensure regularity of meter despite this. And it too exists in versions of varying degrees of melismaticity, depending on liturgical usage. Uh, liturgical use is a little uh, uncertain. I could tell you according to the church calendar when it is to be sung, uh, but it has the subtitle Hedevaksharagan, which can either mean that it ensues the proper canon, which may already have been in existence, so that this was something added to it, or it may mean that it is to be sung whilst walking. And there are testimonies from living memory that in fact the hymn may have been sung uh, in the darkness outdoors with people holding candles and lamps and walking this hymn uh, as they proceeded to the orchard in the vicinity of the church to bless the grapes, because of course grapes are served on the Feast of the Assumption of the Mother of God in the Armenian tradition. So the more melismatic version may well have been suited, suitable for such a procession. Uh, the two versions I have here go something like this. <laughs> But if you remember that you have to sing more than 36 of those, you can see why the faster and syllabic version may be uh, attractive. It goes like and so on and so forth. Um, you can see this is from a 1328 Cilician manuscript hymnal. You can see it in its entirety. The hymn cannot be found in the King Hetum uh, manuscript. Either it did not yet exist then, or even if it existed, it had not been incorporated. And here is Vartabed, uh, that means Archimandrite, and Giragos, Kirakos, the Archimandrite. Uh, of whose identity we are still rather uncertain. Now, the text is really very, very exciting, and it refers to choirs of angels and of virgins singing at the grave during the Dormition. And this brings me back to the images of the Dormition. Uh, there are uh, at least two apocryphal events that are described in this hymn, given that the author had over 36 uh, stanzas, he had sufficient space to include these things. The first one involves St. Peter being amazed and perhaps a little scared, questioning Christ, what is going on? And Christ answers and explains. And the second apocryphal uh, event uh, referred to in the hymn, which I have found in this Vienna hymnal manuscript, which in fact was here in Prague at the Strahov Monastery at one of my exhibitions not very long ago uh, on display. Uh, this is very, very rare, but it refers to a tradition referred to in this hymn, whereby on the third day of the Dormition, St. Bartholomew, who had, alas, been unable to be in Jerusalem himself during the burial uh, of the body of the Virgin, uh, arriving three days later, very much wished to pay his respects so the sepulcher was opened at his request and all the gathered apostles found that in fact the body was not there but there were these lovely flowers exuding a beautiful fragrance instead and you can see this scene uh, uh, depicted uh, here now what about uh, and and now we have finally arrived at the late medieval period as required but what about the subsequent development 
Um, Marian devotion was becoming more and more extensive in the Armenian church tradition. Perhaps uh, the influence of contacts with the Roman Catholic Church through the Crusades and subsequent uh, contacts with uh, Dominican missionaries, I'm not sure. But more and more Magnificat hymns were composed. We still have only 55 of them. But during the time of Catholicus, that's the title of the head of the Armenian church, uh, Gregory the Seventh, Anavarzetsi, who was in office from 1293 to 1307, uh, Magnificats, which had hitherto been sung only on Sundays, uh, became used uh, daily uh, at uh, matins. And also, interpolations into the canon of the day, uh, uh, which again were confined to dominical feasts, became more common by the early 15th century and these interpolations in addition to hymns from Pentecost, hymns for repose, hymns for the Holy Cross also included hymns uh, for the Mother of God. So this perhaps testifies to an intensification of Marian devotion. By way of an epilogue given that we discussed one ode and that was by Saint Gregory of Narek 10th century um, he seems to have stimulated a flurry of composition. Of course, uh, later authors do not necessarily display the same high caliber as St. Gregory of Narek did. But what is amazing is that such odes continued to be composed uh, well into the 18th century, even early in the 19th century. And I know of two particular examples from Constantinople, the first of which is still sung in churches there, it, it conforms to an Ottoman structure. It, it, uh, it has been composed to fit in the form uh, of uh, uh, Ottoman instrumental classical music, remarkably enough. But it is to Christian words devoted to Virgin Mary and it is sung in churches. Archimandrite Comitas actually assumed that it was a medieval hymn and uh, tried to modify it and purify it to, to get rid of Eastern influences as he saw them. And he talked about it in a Paris lecture early in the 20th century. But in fact, he was wrong. It, it is not medieval. It was composed by Hampartzum Limongian late in the 18th century or early in the 19th. And the second example was thought lost. Only a small published fragment uh, was known, but I was lucky enough to discover it. and. Though the manuscript is partly uh, effaced, I was able to reconstruct it with reasonable certainty. And the words are devoted to the Virgin Mary, but there are various uh, witty puns because the composer tries to cover a number of Ottoman makams. These are like modes, as it were, using witty puns that incorporate the names of the makams as parts of longer Armenian words. But according to I my uh, I, dear I, friend and I'm colleague sorry, Jacob Oli, Yes. I'm sorry, interrupting you. Uh, we need to come maybe to the next lecture still. Indeed. So can you Final sentence. To... Final According lecture. to my colleague Jacob Oli, it is probably an, a contrafactum on an existing Ottoman instrumental melody. Uh, these uh, references may be of interest to you and those three books I should like uh, to recommend as well. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much indeed for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you very, very much for your absolutely fascinating um, um, topic and pictures and materials. It's it's incredibly rich. I think we should make uh, once a special workshop only on your material because it's so rich and interesting and unknown. And I always say why we do study beautiful European manuscripts when we have so beautiful manuscripts in Ar Armenia. It's uh, with this stunning decoration. Okay, so I think that we will still time for um, uh, final discussion to coming back to uh, Haigo Tidinchan's paper uh, at the end, but I would like to move now to our third paper uh, by Eliška Poláčková uh, Kubatová. Uh, Eliška Poláčková is a theater theatrologist, uh, historian of theater, 
Um, she is currently uh, working at the University in Olomouc and previously uh, worked in the Institute for Classical Study at the Czech Academy of Sciences. He, her book um, uh, that she recently published, uh, it was her dissertation, is about performative aspects in the medieval literature and, um, and liturgy. And um, currently she's also uh, leading a project devoted to Marian Planktus in the late Middle Ages. And with this project is also connected her paper today uh, with the title uh, Bohemian Planktus Maria Feeling Like a Woman, Thinking Like a Man or Not. Eliška, this is now your floor. Thank you, Hanko, very much for your kind introduction and uh... Thank to all of you who have stayed with us until this very late time. Uh, in the remaining time which we will spend together today, I would like to briefly show you uh, several items from the Bohemian corpus of uh, Marian Laments or Planck Tooth. Uh, and now I will share my presentation with you as a first thing. So here we go and into the presentation mode. Okay, can you see it? Can you hear me well? Yes, absolutely perfect. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So at the beginning, uh, I would like just to uh, briefly introduce you to the genre, although I'm sure very many of you uh, will be perfectly uh, familiar with it by now because it is a quite famous medieval genre, which concerns also textual uh, writings but also texts with melodies so it has been subject to investigation to both musicologists uh, theater uh, and literary uh, historians and theoreticians and also uh, to art historians because as you can already see on my first slide and as i will remark also later uh, this is a genre uh, which has been uh, perceived in relation to uh, visual aids uh, such as uh, sculptures, murals and other uh, visual uh, pieces of art and it has been an important uh, part of its uh, reception and uh, I will also uh, tackle it in relation to the main subject of my today's talk uh, which is the uh, gendered uh, reading of this uh, genre or the Bohemian Corpus in particular, and uh, it will be uh, questions of how these texts can be understood as a sort of uh, gendered textual performance. In other words, how uh, the texts I'm going to speak about in my talk uh, reflect the medieval uh, understanding of uh, what male and female uh, characteristics are in relation uh, to the characters of Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene uh, in the genre uh, of Marian Lament in general and uh, several items of the Bohemian Corpus in particular. This is just to uh, show you uh, the items with which we are working uh, in our uh, research and also the names of uh, the people uh, who are working on the project with me. One of them is uh, Hanka Vohová Werner. Uh, and uh, there are some other uh, people here who are also part of the project. And uh, probably more important is uh, the list of the items. Uh, and as you can see, and I, as I have already mentioned, uh, Marian Lament uh, pertains uh, both uh, textual and musical compositions. And uh, in all parts of Europe, uh, it usually consists of, uh, or the uh, respective regional corpora uh, usually consist of both uh, Latin items and then local vernacular items in case of Bohemian lands. Uh, there are two groups of vernacular laments uh, subject to the inquiry, uh, one German plank tools and then several old Czech compositions. And as is uh, typical of uh, Marian plank tools, all these compositions fall into uh, these different categories also as far as uh, literary or poetic structure is concerned. So we have here uh, 
prose meditations along with verse meditations, uh, but also items uh, that uh, relate to liturgical chants. So we have uh, some Latin sequences and we also have uh, vernacular old Czech uh, devotional poetry modeled after these Latin liturgical sequences. Perhaps I could say also at the beginning uh, that uh, most uh, of our items uh, cannot be really assessed uh, as far as their forms of reception and performance are concerned because uh, there is uh, too scarce evidence for the items to say anything um, uh, substantial about uh, the forms of their reception. But what we know perhaps uh, for sure at the moment is that none of these uh, were performed as a part of liturgy, which is uh, different uh, to some other uh, Marian laments from the rest of Europe or from other parts of Europe uh, where Marian lament uh, was usually part of uh, the uh, mass of the presanctified of the Good Friday liturgies, uh, usually as a part of the adoration, adoratio crucis, or the deposition of the cross uh, to the Holy Sepulchre as a liturgical or even paraliturgical performance. Uh, none of these modes of performance, unfortunately, can be attested uh, for the Bohemian Corpus at the moment, and who knows if we ever venture so far as to find some evidence for them being actually presented as a part of the Mass. But there is evidence for some of them being read aloud in a form of uh, perhaps, para, we can say, paraliturgical, uh, presentation and uh, of course most of them, of them must have been read uh, as a part of uh, private devotion even though we don't have any uh, like uh, direct evidence for this uh, uh, type of usage. Uh, just to mention briefly several words about uh, the genre in general. Uh, it originated uh, in Western Europe in the 12th century under the influence of Eastern uh, liturgy and Eastern church writing, especially of the Contakia of uh, Romanos Melodos and the homilies of Jacob of Sarong. In these uh, Eastern or especially later Byzantine forms of Marian devotion, uh, Virgin Mary started to be represented in these uh, early uh, centuries of uh, the existence of Christian church uh, as a grievous figure who is standing at the base of the cross, uh, desperately lamenting and weeping over the death of her son, as you can see in this beautiful sculpture uh, of Pieta from the 14th century, uh, which uh, uh, comes from uh, Czechlands and is uh, currently uh, in almost Archdiocesan Museum. This image of Mary uh, represented uh, in grief at the site of the death of her son at the cross uh, was, was by no means uh, typical in Western Europe at that time and uh, indeed not until the beginning of the 12th century. Uh, the dominant uh, mode of presentation of Mary uh, at the situation of the crucifixion by the 12th century, on the contrary, uh, was the image of uh, a stoic, uh, even impassive figure. Uh, as we know, uh, St. Ambrose uh, famously says, uh, I saw Mary standing at the cross, but I didn't see her weeping. Uh, there is an exception, uh, as it usually is, uh, with Hrabanus Maurus, who is one of the rare uh, Western authors uh, before the start of the 12th century, who in fact de does depict uh, Mary uh, in her lamentable position. And uh, in his uh, writings, we already encounter much of uh, the motives that later, uh, 12th century and onwards, become uh, the staple of uh, the genre of Planctus Maria. But in general, the situation of uh, representing Mary as grieving uh, and desperately lamenting the death of her son uh, doesn't uh, become commonplace in Western devotional tradition until uh, perhaps uh, the end of the 12th century. And uh, 
the devotional mode with which uh, the Planck tools was uh, uh, related to a great extent and which is worth noting in relation to the gendered performance of uh, Marianne Lamens is uh, the uh, devotional paradigm called affective devotion, uh, which has been popularized uh, several years ago, especially by Sarah McNamer in her seminal book, Affective Meditation and the Invention of Medieval Compassion. Uh, in which uh, she contextualized, uh, among many other things, the genres of the Planctus Maria uh, in the strand of the affective devotion, which uh, she characterized as a distinctly emotional, performative and uh, feminine approach uh, to the veneration of Jesus Christ and especially uh, to the recognition of his passion and death. Uh, so this is one uh, important devotional strand with which uh, the origin of the Planctus Maria in the Western uh, devotional thinking is uh, related. Uh, yet another is the passion devotion and uh, the re related uh, forms uh, of devotion such as uh, Franciscan piety in which the image of uh, suffering Christ, Christ in pain, uh, Christ dying on the cross uh, and Christ being deposed in his grave uh, very prominent and uh, served uh, to disseminate uh, and uh, further instill uh, the faith in, uh, especially among uh, the lay devotees. Uh, and the last uh, fountain from which uh, the Planctus Maria um, draw its uh, uh, origins was the intercessory prayers uh, to the Virgin. Uh, in which uh, the devotional concept of compassio uh, sprang uh, as a seminal motif, not only for these prayers, but also for uh, all different forms of uh, affective passion, including Planctus Maria. Uh, so uh, this concept of compassio or uh, compassion uh, is uh, related to uh, the feelings which uh, the devotee should feel towards the Virgin Mary, uh, sorry, towards the Christ, modeled after uh, the, the affectus or feeling emotion, which according to many Western theologians, uh, the Virgin Mary uh, experienced towards her, her son uh, watching his suffering at the cross. And this emotion uh, is usually uh, characterized by the medieval theologians uh, as an ultimate, ultimate uh, feeling of love and care uh, and feeling the same feelings uh, as the Christ did uh, in the event. So uh, this uh, compassionate approach to Christ's suffering is uh, one of the crucial um, motifs of uh, the Planctus Maria. Uh, yet another would be the adoption of uh, Mary's perspective uh, in the narration of uh, the, the event of crucifixion and the related events such as uh, the journey to Golgotha or the deposition uh, and uh, um, putting uh, the dead body of Christ into the sepulchre. Um, yet another uh, Important feature would be uh, something which is usually described in literature as uh, active participation of the devotee in the narrated uh, events, uh, which is uh, involved in these compositions and especially in the ways of their reception uh, by the interaction of the text as it was recepted, either if it was recited or if it was sung with uh, the type of pictorial representations which we have seen in the presentation of uh, Menai Mikhail, uh, who showed us the beautiful images of Pieta, uh, similar to the Krivax Pieta, which I'm uh, showing you at the moment. And uh, these images were uh, important uh, to uh, draw the uh, uh, faithful to emerge as if in the situation of the Virgin Mary at the cross and the uh, feeling, so to say, like being in her shoes and watching uh, the situation from her perspective, which is also uh, the way in which uh, the 
uh, crucial situation of Planck tools is uh, usually described in, in the various uh, compositions, although uh, the actual voice, uh, the narrative voice of the text does not necessarily always needs to be uh, the first person narration of Mary herself, but it can also be, as you can see uh, in this short extract from the Czech uh, Life of Christ the Lord, and it's Planck to sequence, narrated by someone else. So in fact, uh, this active participation of the devotee uh, in the narration of the Planck tools uh, can be invoked by other ways than just the monological first person narration, but it can be also uh, invoked by uh, the interaction between the devotee uh, experiencing the text and experiencing uh, the visual representation such as the Pieta. Uh, what I wanted to show you here in terms of the gendered uh, textual performance of uh, some of the items of the Bohemian Corpus. The first text I would like to show to you into more depth is the Planktus Mariae from uh, the manuscript of Hradec Králové, which is uh, Codex Mextus written around 1350, which uh, must have been owned um, by uh, some individual, uh, either a preacher was suggested or a professional performer, or indeed a nun or a monk, which is uh, the, the explanation I favor the most, and you will see uh, later why. And as you can also see in the picture, uh, the manuscript is of very minute uh, pocket uh, size, uh, um, range. Uh, it is, uh, I believe, uh, 11 to 8.5 centimeters large, so it can be easily handled uh, as a means of personal devotion. But what concerns us here more uh, than the actual performance of the Planck tools is the way in which uh, female uh, uh, aspect uh, is represented in the Planck tools, uh, which uh, on the first side is uh, similar to the um, standard representation of Virgin Mary or Mary Magdalene in uh, Marianne Lament uh, as a model uh, for the devotional response of uh, the faithful recipient to the uh, scene of the Planck tools, uh, as you can see here uh, in the short textual extract. Uh, but actually, uh, in the course of this uh, Lament, uh, the position of Mary as, a, as the, the authority uh, in the devotional uh, response to Christ's suffering and death is replaced by the dominance of the figure of Saint John, who um, can be a completely a side figure in some of the laments, uh, not even being assigned any speaking part. But on the contrary, he can uh, become uh, a prominent figure on the Planctus uh, of the Planctus, almost on a par with Mary herself or the figure of Jesus Christ. Uh, as uh, again, uh, Mina uh, has remarked uh, when he spoke about uh, the type of uh, Saint John as uh, Alter Christus, uh, second Christ, or almost equal to Christ. And indeed, uh, in the Planctus Maria in uh, the Lament uh, of Hradec Králov, uh, sorry, in the manuscript of Hradec Králové, we encounter John uh, as uh, a figure uh, who is even more important than Mary, uh, than Virgin Mary her herself, and his uh, approach to Christ's suffering is understood and uh, reflected as uh, being prior uh, to her emotional a feminized like uh, type of response uh, since he is elevated into the position uh, of a preacher, uh, which is, uh, I believe, apparent from uh, the second extract I'm showing now in uh, the slide, uh, which uh, shows that uh, John adopts here a standard uh, catechetic idiom in which he is explaining the whereabouts of um, of uh, Christ's sacrifice uh, in uh, the language, which is distinctly theological, impassive, uh, rationalized, and intellectualized, in contrast 
uh, to the uh, exaggerated and uh, uh, highly emotional uh, lines of the Virgin as they go throughout uh, this uh, whole Panctus from the Panctus Maria from uh, the manuscript of Hradec Králové. So what we can see in this uh, Panctus is uh, some intensific is uh, a type of subversion of uh, the standard idiom of uh, Marian lament in which uh, the female uh, approach to Christ's suffering, uh, which is uh, described as emotional, compassionate, loving and non-rational, uh, is uh, downplayed by the masculine response uh, by St. John, who is uh, um, represented in the lament uh, as a standard generic preacher. Uh, this situation, uh, if, uh, if I were right in uh, considering uh, the manuscript belonging to a nun, uh, then the situation of, uh, into which the Virgin Mary and St. John are placed in the narrative of the lament would be parallel uh, to the actual situation of uh, the presentation or one of the possible forms of presentation of this lament uh, to the audience, which would be a homily, as you can see in this uh, last paragraph uh, from the lament in which we read that uh, this lament can be either read or listened to uh, every Friday, which uh, shows us that uh, it uh, could have been used as a, a sermon and could be preached either uh, privately to a nun or uh, an aristocratic woman or uh, to a larger group of devotees. So, there is also uh, the final line of St. John, who also uh, does not leave us in a doubt whose response to Christ's suffering is the most important uh, for the sake of uh, the devotion and the emulation of the devotee, uh, if it is the response of Mary or the St. John. Because here John says that Christ always feels a pain bigger uh, then it's yours, it means Mary's, however great it is. And thus the male figures are prioritized uh, in this planktus over the female form of response. And uh, this uh, strategy uh, has also other counterparts in, in the whole composition. So there uh, can be given other evidences for this prioritization of the female response and the masculinity uh, in the devotion over the female. But I would just briefly uh, move to the second lament uh, in this manuscript, the uh, lament of uh, Mary Magdalene, in which uh, something really interesting happens and the standard catalog of uh, uh, female uh, fallibilities is invoked only uh, to be immediately uh, subverted into putting Mary Magdalene as a, as a supreme model for emulation in her femininity and in her female response to, uh, to Christ's suffering. First, uh, her error, uh, as it is uh, invoked in Bible, is reminded only uh, to be uh, immediately uh, subverted by saying uh, that her female error uh, should be considered uh, the laugh uh, of the disciple, that is uh, Mary Magdalene, who is dying for Christ because of her grief, since she is not crying for an error as a trick, but only for love and pain. So uh, the female, st uh, the stereotypes uh, about femininity uh, in uh, medieval theology are in invoked here, but they are subverted to say that in fact, the female emotional loving response is the most proper one actually in reflecting the situation of the planktus. And furthermore, uh, Mary Magdalene is uh, underpinned as uh, the model for emulation, uh, in, especially in this part of the lament, when we read that uh, uh, the devotee should follow 
uh, the, this prudent woman, that is Mary Magdalene, and that the, devo the devotee should learn from her to weep more than uh, he used to do, to cry uh, the lost God and cry to find him, to have hope in Christ uh, and find him searching for him. So again, here we can see uh, that Mary Magdalene uh, is shown here as the paradigm uh, for the proper uh, devotional resp response to Christ's suffering. And in the last, uh, uh, we can say, uh, poetic turn, uh, Mary Magdalene uh, steps into conversation with uh, the angels and she actually rejects their rational, logocentric, uh, intellectual response to uh, Christ's suffering and passion, saying, I don't want to see the angels because they would start talking to me too much. And if I wanted to answer them to all they say, I'm afraid it would harm my love more than help it. So surprisingly enough, in this final turn of the composition, Mary Magdalene explicitly rejects the intellectual rational that is in medieval understanding or medieval theology, a masculine response to Christ's suffering and uh, prioritizes the emotional loving response in its stead. Uh, and uh, since I don't have uh, much time left, I believe uh, I would just conclude uh, saying that uh, apparently Mary Magdalene is in this composition showed as a sort of parallel to uh, the depiction of Saint John, uh, which we find most importantly in the English, Planctus Maria, uh, the depiction of Saint John as a feminized man. And what we can see here in the Bohemian Planctus is a sort of uh, inverted image of this feminized man. Uh, and I believe we can say that Mary Magdalene uh, in this uh, composition is uh, modeled as a sort of masculinized woman, which is also once stated explicitly uh, in the composition when we read in Czech that Mary Magdalene is žena, jenže ženské nenie, which we could uh, translate either as uh, she is a woman who does not appear like a woman or as a woman who is not feminine at all. So I would end up saying that uh, apparently Planktus Maria is a very interesting genre in terms, uh, in terms of uh, gender, uh, understanding of gender in relation to uh, high and late de de medieval devotional practice, since uh, on one hand, several, some of the compositions can uh, underline, emphasize and cement the standard uh, approach to uh, the typical gender response uh, in the affective devotion, but at the same time, some of the compositions, such as the Planktus Maria Magdalene from the manuscript of Hradec Králové, can do very, the very opposite and uh, subvert very overtly uh, the standard uh, gender categories and uh, underline the fact that sometimes the female feeling like female is better than thinking like a man. So that's all from me. Thank you uh, for your uh, patience. <laughs>